Let's talk about Bohr models. Get out your science notebook. Here's the essential question. What are Bohr models and how do you draw them? This is a traditional model of an atom. One you might see it at the beginning of a textbook or if you were to type an atom online and look at an image search. And is this model true? Well, according to this guy, Niels Bohr, the answer is no. So what was Niels Bohr's problem with the atom? Well, he said, if you were to think about it, the center of an atom is positively charged thanks to the protons, and the outside of the atom is negatively charged thanks to the electrons. And what we know about positive and negative charges? Well, they attract. So shouldn't the electrons be sucked into the nucleus and the whole atom cease to be? So Niels Bohr got to think, why do elements emit specific colored light? For example, like when we did the flame tests, why do certain elements emit certain colors? Similarly, if we take a look at elements and their emission spectra, their fingerprints of visible light from stars, why do they emit specific bands of light? Well, Bohr came up with certain key ideas of a new type of atom model called the Bohr's model. And these are them. He said that atoms electrons have to stay in specific energy level orbits. He also said that electrons further away from the nucleus have higher energy than those closest to the nucleus. The ones closest to the nucleus we would say are in the ground state and the ones farther away from the nucleus and the highest energy levels are in the excited state. Now electrons can jump between energy levels. They can't exist between energy levels, but they can jump from one energy level to another by receiving energy or by losing energy, typically in the form of heat and light. Well, that helps us understand how the flame tests work. If you think about all the different elements, they all have their different variations in Bohr models and different types of electrons and different energy levels. Now, the different jumps that electrons can do between those energy levels help explain why certain elements emit specific colors of light. So how do we draw a Bohr model? Well, first, let's review some of the essential subatomic particle things we can get from the periodic table. Remember that the periodic table can tell us the atomic number, the element symbol, the element name, and the average atomic mass. This information lets us know how many numbers of protons there are. Remember, that's the atomic number, always for that element, and only that element gets that atomic number. The number of neutrons is the atomic mass minus the atomic number. And if we take the average mass minus the atomic number, that's the average isotope. The number of electrons is typically the number of protons because the negatively charged electrons are opposite of the positively charged protons. And that's if the element is neutrally charged, which we're going to assume for now. All right, so drawing Bohr models. Now that we remember that information, let's talk about how we use the periodic table to draw Bohr models. And I'm calling this the board game method. If we use the periodic table, we're going to say that the energy levels, or how many rings the Bohr model have, has, is the row number that that element exists on. Now, the electron placement is, we're just going to follow along with the element spaces in a row. If this doesn't quite make sense, bear with me right now. We'll go through an example and it will start to make more sense. Now, there are a few special rules, namely transition metals and lanthanides and actinides, those elements lower on the periodic table. Well, the transition metals, these green ones here you see, when we get to them, their electrons drop one energy level. And the lanthanides and actinides, those drop two energy levels. Let's go through an example to help this clarify what we're saying here. Let's draw the Bohr model for an average carbon atom. So this is carbon as you would read on the periodic table. Remember, this is going to help us determine how many protons, neutrons, and electrons an element has. Well, let's talk about the nucleus first. The nucleus of, of an average carbon atom has six protons and six neutrons. Six protons because the atomic number is six, and six neutrons for an average isotope of carbon because if we round the average atomic mass is 12, and then we minus the six protons from that. 
Well, how many rings does a carbon bore model have? Well, carbon is found on the second row of the periodic table. So we are going to put two electron energy levels here, a low energy, a ground state energy level, and an excited state energy level. All right, so how do we put the electrons in there? Well, if we think about it, we know that this neutral carbon atom is going to have six electrons. So which energy levels do those electrons go on? Well, this is where the board game method comes into place. In a typical board game, we always start at space one. So let's do that. The first electron is going to go on the first energy level. That's the very top row of the periodic table. If we keep going, the second electron is also going to go on the first energy level. Well, now we're done with the first energy level. So let's jump to the next energy level. The next electron is going to go on the second energy level. And then the next one's also going to go on the second energy level. And I'm going to keep going until I get to carbon. Once I reach carbon, I'm done. This is the Bohr model for carbon. There are two electrons on the first energy level and four electrons on the second energy level, totaling six electrons. So here's the board game method again. Hopefully it makes a little bit more sense. It gets a little bit more challenging with the special rules down below, but we're going to go ahead and practice that next. Before we do that, however, I want to point out a tool found on your periodic table. If you look on the back side, you'll see this box in the, called the electron configuration section. Now, we're not going to worry about the semantics of all the little details here, such as the S block, the D block, and the P block. What we can use here is those numbers. Notice that if we follow along with the board game method, the numbers represent the energy level of electron. The letters there, just, just so you know, represent the shape that those electrons make in 3D space. That's a little bit beyond the scope of this class, but you can see here that electrons, when they float around the nucleus, they make various models, they make various three-dimensional shapes as they float around there. All right, so let's try another example. This time, let's take a look at arsenic. So how do we draw the Bohr model for arsenic? I would pause the video and see if you could try to figure this one out yourself. Did you pause it and try it? I sure hope so. Well, here's arsenic. Let's talk about the center or the nucleus. The center of the nucleus has 33 protons and 42 neutrons. So remember, this is just the average isotope of arsenic. How many rings does arsenic have? Well, if you found arsenic on the periodic table, it's down here. It's on the fourth period or fourth row of the periodic table. So there are four rings of this Bohr model. Remember, the lowest ring, the one closest to the nucleus, is the ground state. And the higher you get, the more excited those electrons or the more higher energy those electrons are. Now, where do the electrons go on each of the rings? That's where the board game method comes into play. We always start at the very beginning of the board game, up here. So let's start counting electrons. One, two electrons go on the very first ground state energy level of the Bohr model. Now we're going to jump to the next energy level up. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. There are eight electrons on the second energy level. Now we're going to keep going. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. There are eight electrons that go on the third energy level. Let's go to the next energy level. One, two. All right, I'm going to pause here for a moment because this is where it gets a little tricky. We've now reached these green elements on the periodic table known as the transition metals. And if you looked at our special rules from the board game method, these spaces on our board game, on our periodic table, actually fall down a level. So when I start to count these electrons, they don't go on the highest energy level. They go on the energy level right below. So these electrons, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, actually go on the third ring, not the highest energy level. So that's the special rules we need to be aware of. Now, once we reach the main elements again, once we're out of those transition elements, we start to go back on the highest energy level. So we're almost arsenic. We just have one, 
two, and three left over. So here is the Bohr model for the average arsenic atom. All right, that's the end of the notes. Take a moment to review and highlight key terms. If you have any questions, make sure to write those down, but don't, just seek, don't forget to seek answers to those questions. Finally, summarize and answer the essential question. Good luck.